This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. This is Parley Bear. Welcome, as I present two more new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Tom Conway and Nigel Bruce. If you remember our last series of Sherlock Holmes shows, then you're aware that the late Ben Wright acted as host for our series of original broadcasts, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. Now, you will finally have a chance to hear Ben portray the great detective in the case of the Egyptian curse. Ben was one of my dearest friends. I, I'd just like to put aside my notes and just kind of talk to you a little bit about this wonderful man. Ben had already been an established actor on the British stage before he came to America in 1947. A graduate of RADA, the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, Ben was a brilliant dialectician. And over the years he was able to use that talent in many of the dramatic roles he played on radio, television, and in motion pictures. Ben quickly established himself as a radio actor. In fact, his first performances were on the Sherlock Holmes radio series that you're listening to now. He went on to become a much-wanted, regularly employed actor on such shows as Suspense, Escape, Gunsmoke, Frontier Gentleman, and had the running part of Hey Boy, Paladin's Chinese houseboy, on radio's Have Gun, Will Travel. He was a quiet and engaging gentleman, and Ben was easy to work with, had a wonderful, dry, and witty sense of humor, and poured his heart into every role. He also gave memorable performances in such films as Judgment at Nuremberg, opposite Spencer Tracy, The Wreck of the Merry Deer, as Gary Cooper's salvage ship partner, and as the evil, plain-clothed Nazi who chases the Von Trapp family across the border in The Sound of Music. One time when Ben and I were having a casual conversation, he mentioned he regretted only one thing as an actor, that he never had a chance to do comedy. <laughs> he was always being taken for one of the better dramatic character actors. That bugged him. You want to know how bright Ben was? Well, he was the only man I knew who could do a New York Times crossword puzzle with a ballpoint pen. Oh, ben was not just an actor. He was also a writer. And actually penned the radio script to Ferret Mandrake for the Escape radio series. And he played opposite John Daner on that show. As if that weren't enough, you should hear Ben's tour de force performance in Escape's Diary of a Madman. Here, Ben plays a Nazi officer trapped in the African desert with his men. In one half hour, Ben takes the officer from a leader of his men to a raving madman on the brink of insanity. A slow and brilliant transition that displays all of Ben's innate abilities as an actor. Though this broadcast aired in January of 1953, there are copies of it still floating around, so try to find one and, and give it a listen. I tell you, you won't be disappointed. In 1949, I think it was, Ben portrayed Inspector Collins in Escape's adaptation of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Lost Special. Ben portrayed Inspector Collins with an almost Sherlock Holmesian quality. Very interesting. Uh, I'll return later with more stories on Ben, but now let's listen to another fine actor, Tom Conway, as Sherlock Holmes in Q for Murder. <laughs> Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's Monday night and time to keep that weekly date with our good friend and host, Dr. Watson. Let's join him, shall we? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Good evening, Mr. Bell. Draw up your usual chair. Ah, that's it. There's tobacco jar in the, the jar there beside you. Thank you, Dr. Watson. 
And now, how about tonight's new Sherlock Holmes? Oh, adventure? my boys, I told you last week the story took place in the fetid depths lurking behind the wharfs which lie on the north side of the river near London Bridge. Sounds like good old Limehouse to me. <laughs> it was, Mr. Bell, though I prefer to call it bad old Limehouse. For it's a neighborhood where human life was held cheap, and a scream in the night or the sickening thud of a criminal's bludgeon were almost commonplace. That, Mr. Bell, is the setting for the weird adventure that I call Q for Murder. Dr. Watson, you're beginning to make my hair stand on end. Oh, speaking of hair, Mr. Bell, haven't you a, a message for our listeners? <laughs> yes, Dr. Watson, I have. Naturally, most any man who takes pride in his appearance uses a hairdressing to keep his hair in place. And men, what about the product you're using at present? Do you find it too greasy, too highly perfumed? Does it make your hair feel sticky and dirty? Then here's a tip. Change to Cremel hair tonic. This highly specialized hair tonic has just enough light oil to keep hair handsomely groomed. Every hair neatly in place with a rich, healthy-looking luster. Yet Cremel never leaves hair looking or feeling greasy or sticky. This is because Cremel contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which is found in no other hair tonic. After you use Cremel, just run your hand back over your hair. Notice how delightfully clean your hair feels. Notice how no greasy film comes off on your hand or hat band. Cremel always gives hair such a handsome, clean-cut look. As if you just combed it. And it keeps it that way all day long. K-R-E-M-L. Cremel hair tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, I'm eager to hear the new Sherlock Holmes story, Q for Murder. Well, Mr. Bell, that strange adventure began in the small hours of a foggy November morning. An emergency call at midnight had roused me from my warm bed, and a rattling horse cab had taken me to the Limehouse District when an old patient of mine lay desperately ill. For hours, I did my best to save a life that flickered in the balance. Finally, I decided that an ambulance was necessary. The sick man needed the resources of a hospital. Accordingly, I left the house and began to walk the cobbled streets looking for a policeman. But Limehouse at three in the morning is a deserted and frightening district. I could hear the ghostly tooting of the fog horns on the riverboats in the distance. As I walked along... Eyes alert, my hand was on the trusted revolver in my pocket, for I was no stranger to the risks involved in walking the streets of Limehouse at such an hour. Suddenly, under the flickering gaslight ahead of me, I saw the blurry outline of a London policeman. So I called out, Constable! Constable! The man didn't hear me, for he suddenly turned abruptly and disappeared down the steep flight of steps his bullseye lantern dancing away like a fading will-o'-the-wisp into the encircling gloom. I decided to follow that vanishing figure, and I quickened my footsteps. After a moment, I saw where the policeman had gone. Between a shop shop and a gin shop, I noticed a steep flight of stairs leading down a black gap that looked like the mouth of a cave. I walked down them. The steps were worn hollow in the center by the ceaseless tread of stumbling feet. I reached the bottom. A door faced me, and above it, a flickering oil lamp winked warnings at me. I found the latch of the door, lifted it. The door squeaked open protestingly, and I entered. There was a tinkle of glass-beaded curtains as I walked towards a long, low room. A strange sight met my eyes. Through the gloom, thick and heavy with the filthy brown smoke of opium, I saw that the room was terraced with wooden berths. Bodies lay in strange, fantastic poses. Bowed shoulders, bent knees, and heads thrown back. Suddenly an attendant walked up to me with a pipe and beckoned me to an empty berth. This way, please. I haven't come here to smoke that foul drug. I saw a policeman enter this place a few moments ago. I want to speak to him. No policeman here. I'm carrying the revolver, so you'd better not argue with me, my good man. Where'd he go? He in back room. Ma, sit there. Follow me, please. In here. Well, bless my soul if it ain't Dr. Watson. All right, Wong, you can leave us. Yes, sir. I go. 
And you seem to know me, Constable, but I don't recall meeting you before. Oh, I've seen you and Mr. Holmes at Scotland Yard, Doctor. My name's Medi- Merriweather, Constable Merriweather. You couldn't have arrived at a better time, sir. This man needs a doctor, bad. Poor well, fellow. Well, uh, patient of mine nearby needs an ambulance. That's why I followed you down here. Oh, I'll examine this wretched fellow first. How did you know he was, he was here, Constable? They sent a message to the station. Uh, said he was in trouble here. He's in trouble, yes. He's in trouble, all right. The poor devil's coughing his life away. Nothing I can do but make his dying a little more comfortable. Here you are. Um, hand me my bag, Constable, will you? Here you are, Doctor. Yes, I'll give him a sedative. At least it'll keep him out of pain. Who are you? What you do? I'm a doctor, my man. Here, this will ease your pain. There. Are you good man, doctor? You help me. Now you help me kill devil who brings opium to my people. Brings opium? What are you talking about? You, good man. You find Dr. Sturgeon. He, bad man. They bring opium. Sturgeon? I've heard of a Dr. Sturgeon. What's his address? He's asleep, Doctor. Yes. This poor devil's eyes are numbers, I'm afraid. You know, Dr. Watson, this is a great honor for me. I read every story you've written. To me, Sherlock Holmes is almost like a god, you might say. Oh, thanks very much. One of these days, I hope to be a detective myself. Indeed, and I think if you study me, you might learn a few pointers. I shall lose no time in investigating this matter. I may be able to expose a, a shocking scandal. Hadn't you better leave that to Mr. Sherlock Holmes, sir? That's more in his line, isn't oh, it? No rubbish, my good man. This is one case that I'm more than capable of handling myself. I shall call on Dr. Sturgeon as soon as his office opens in the morning. I am Miss Stark, Dr. Sturgeon's secretary. And I'm afraid you can't see the doctor now. His first patient is due at any moment, and you haven't got an appointment. But I'm a doctor myself. My name is Watson. Nevertheless, you'll have to make an appointment. Now, look here, my good woman. I'm I not... am not your good woman. And you cannot see Dr. Sturgeon. But uh, Sturgeon and I were friends at, at, at medical school together. Sturgeon the surgeon, we <laughs> call him. That's <laughs> funny, don't you think, Miss Stark? <laughs> not at all. Oh, and what medical college did you attend, Dr. Watson? The University of London. Odd that you should have met Dr. Sturgeon. He studied at the University of Glasgow. Oh, well, I was at Glasgow, too, for a while, now that you mention it. <laughs> You've wasted enough of my time. I don't know what you're after, but I think you'd better leave. Good, good heavens. What was that? Came from the doctor's office. Come along. Dr. Sturgeon. Uh, uh, he's choking. I'll loosen his oh. colour. <laughs> Dr. Sturgeon. What is it? He's trying to say something. <laughs> But he's dead. Look. Look at the marks on his throat. Great heavens, he's been strangled, Miss Stark. Stay here and guard the body. I'm going to fetch Sherlock Holmes at once. Who is it? Oh. Oh, you're back again. Yes, Miss Stark, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, no one's been here since I left? No. Patient came into the outer office, but I sent her away. Splendid. Tell me, Miss Stark, is there another entrance to this office? Yes, Mr. Holmes. The doctor had a private door from the outside leading into the laboratory in there. He always let himself in that way. Did he ever admit patients by that private door? Why should I answer your questions? You're not the police. I appreciate your loyalty, Miss Stark, but I assure you that if you're trying to protect your dead employer, you'll find me to be more understanding than Scotland Yard. Very well. What do you want to know? I repeat my question. Did Dr. Sturgeon admit patients by his private door? Yes, he did, Mr. Holmes. Sometimes. I never saw them, but I'd hear voices in there. Hmm. A perfect way of distributing drugs without anybody knowing. Are you implying that Dr. Quite. 
You say that as he was dying, he kept pointing to a pad on his desk, Watson? Yes, his arm's lying across it now. Hmm. Let's see if there's any message written on the pad. Ah, there is. It's an address. 116 Upper Swandham Lane, Millwall. That's in the heart of Limehouse. Precisely. An odd address to find written on the desk pad of a Harley Street physician. Watson, you're convinced that as the man was dying, he uttered the word peace? Well, that's what it sounded like to me. Peace. Well, perhaps he meant that death would bring him peace after his mortal sins. And possibly, Watson. And now to examine the marks on the dead man's throat. I think I'll wait in the other room, if you don't mind. Hmm. Looks as if he was strangled with a piece of rope. Look more closely. Observe these traces of oil on the throat. And look. Look at this. By Jove, a long black hair. That means a woman did it. No, Watson, I think not. The combination of long, black, oily hair and a limehouse address would point to one obvious conclusion. Dr. Sturgeon was strangled with a Chinese cube. Strangled with a cube? But how would that be possible? That, my dear Watson, is our next problem. Tell Miss Tark to send for the police. Our work here is done. We're going to limehouse? Certainly. As soon as we have adopted suitable disguises, we shall investigate the mystery of 116 Upper Swandham Lane. I pray that the answer to murder lies there. <laughs> My soul, Holmes, you make the most convincing-looking dark hand. Thank you, Watson. Now, let me see. One, one, six. It's the next house. There's a policeman staring just outside it. It's Constable Merriweather, the one I met last night. Hello, Constable. Something happened? Never you mind. Just keep moving Oh, well, we ain't doing now, mate. We, we now, we're just going down in a pig and whistle for part of the mill that my little biller. Ain't that right, Alfie? Of course it is, baby. Then off you go, both of you. Oh, can't a bloke stop and pass the time of day? Ain't you been a bit narky, chum? Aye, uh, here, what's, uh, what's happened here? Murder. That's what's happened. Now move along there. Murder? And at the address on Dr. Sturgeon's pad. Here, here, who are you? Oh, it's all right, Merriweather. It's Mr. Sherlock Holmes. Well, blow me down. I'd never have recognized you, gentlemen. But what brought you to this address? I'll explain that later, Constable. Who has been murdered? A Chinese gentleman got himself done in. Was he uh, strangled? I don't rightly know, sir. What do you mean you don't know? Surely the evidence of strangulation is perfectly easy to detect? Well, I suppose it is. But you see, in this case, Mr. Holmes, the corpse ain't got no head. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Leading hair specialists in this country constantly advise us to take better care of the hair we've got. And men, don't forget, one of the first requisites of handsome, healthy-looking hair is a hygienic scalp. So why buy just any hairdressing when you can enjoy the extra benefits of this highly specialized Kreml hair tonic? Kreml contains a special combination of hair grooming ingredients which has never been duplicated in any other hair tonic. That's why Kreml keeps hair in place longer, always looking neat and orderly. But Kreml does lots more than keep hair looking handsome. Kreml is simply great to lubricate a dry scalp. At the same time, it removes dandruff flakes and leaves your scalp feeling so alive and invigorated. And men, if your hair is so dry it breaks and falls when you comb it, Kreml actually helps condition the hair in that it makes it feel softer, more pliable, and look as if it had some body to it. So, men, buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. Ask for an application at your barber shop. Use Kreml daily for better groomed hair, for a more hygienic scalp. K-R-E-M-L. Kreml hair tonic. Well, Dr. Watson, what happened next? Well, my boy, we quickly entered the house and examined the scene of the latest tragedy. Constable Merriweather seemed to be in a seventh heaven of delight to realize that he was working on a case... With the great Sherlock Holmes himself. I'm glad you're here, and no mistake, Mr. Holmes. I'm a little out of my depth in a case like this, and I don't mind admitting it. <laughs> Merriweather's a great admirer of yours, Holmes. He's, he's read every story that I've written. Indeed. You have a strong constitution, Constable. 
Though I will admit that this case presents as bizarre a problem as my friend has ever included in his rather sensational accounts. What I can't understand, sir, is why they took the head. For that matter, how was it stolen? Before we theorize, let us assemble the facts. Has the body been identified, Constable? Uh, yes, sir. You see, he had a missing finger on one hand. Then, obviously, the head was not stolen in order to make identification of the corpse difficult. Who is the victim? A Chinese merchant by the name of Li Ming uh, ran a shop downstairs in the basement. Please describe the circumstances under which you discovered the crime. Well, gentlemen, I was on my beat, and I saw the dead man walk up the stairs from the basement and go into the house. That passed the time of day with me, he did. Two houses down, I stopped to talk to the fishmonger outside his shop. I must have talked to him for 15 minutes or more. What time was this, Merriweather? Just after 10 o'clock, sir. I see. Please continue. Well, sir, all the time I was watching this house. Suddenly, there was an oaring and a yelling, and I runs back to find the man lying in here with his head gone. You were watching the house all the time, you say, Merriweather? Yes, sir, just idle-like. But I'll swear no one went in or out. Which means that somebody inside the house must be the killer. That's what I think, Doctor. Who are the other tenants? Well, Mr. Holmes, on this floor there's an old Chinese lady, a servant to the dead man she was. But she's half crippled with rheumatism, and I swear she couldn't have done it. But upstairs there's a Chinese gentleman, Prince Fu Tsen. A prince? <laughs> in these surroundings? He's got quite a place, too. Then you've already interviewed him? Oh, yes, sir. He and his nephew are up there. Swore they didn't have nothing to do about it, but the young fella acted mighty suspicious-like. Perhaps you'd like to go up there, sir. I know you'd handle these foreigners better than me. Very well, Constable. Let us visit Prince Fu Tsen at once. Come on in there. Come on. Open up in the name of the law. I'm afraid the name of the law doesn't appeal to them. Unless I'm much mistaken, they're barricading furniture on the other side of the door. Yes, well, three good shoulders can take care of that, Holmes. Good idea, Watson. Come on. Mm. One, two, three. Oh. There you go. Once more, Mr. Holmes, and we'll do it. Oh. Oh, oh, Chief, you, you have no right to break in like this. Oh, yes, we have, Mr. Adolfo. You're under suspicion of committing murder. I've already told you that I know nothing about it. Then in that case, Mr. Fu, why barricade the door? What blazes are you? I am Sherlock Holmes, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watson. Why, may I ask, is that partially packed Gladstone bag lying on the settee there? Were you uh, thinking of leaving? Of course I was. Well, you say you know nothing about this, then why admit guilt by running away? Because I know this policeman suspected me. They call me a Eurasian, but I'm Western by instinct and education. Because the color of my skin compels me to live in this part of London, I... I knew that I was bound to be associated with a Chinese crime. Despite your instincts and education, Mr. Fu, you seem to have a very poor opinion of British justice. Huh. Where is your uncle, Prince Fu Tsen? In the study. Uh, you can lead the way if you don't mind, Mr. Fu. I'd like to keep my eye on you. Oh, very well. Follow me. Well, I must say it's a sumptuous flat, Holmes. Some of these oriental furnishings must be priceless. Yes, Watson. Quite incongruous in such a district. Uncle, that policeman's back again. And there's some other men with him. Won't you come in, gentlemen? Prince Fu, this is Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. How do you do? Uh, welcome do do? Uh, to my humble abode, gentlemen. And uh, perhaps I may be permitted to ask why two such famous men should be dressed like riffraff from the quayside. We're investigating a murder, Prince Fu. You have come to speak to me of murder, Mr. Holmes? But I have already told the constable that I have no knowledge concerning the tragedy of which he spoke. Possibly, Prince Fu, but uh, as we came in just now, the door was barricaded and your nephew's bag was packed. He admitted that he was going to leave. Harold, my boy, what uh, prompted you to such an action? You have no knowledge of the crime. How could I prove it? You know as well as I do, Uncle, that a Eurasian hasn't got a chance. Quiet, Harold. Uh, Mr. Holmes. You must forgive the boy. He is young. Young and bitter. But he will learn in time that he is neither English nor Chinese. He is something far greater. He is a man. Oh, the devil with your moralizing, Uncle. Prince Fu, you are a man of intelligence, and I'll put our cards on the table. 
the dead merchant downstairs and a certain doctor in Harley Street who was also murdered today were undoubtedly both involved in peddling narcotics. I believe they were both killed by an associate who was afraid they might implicate him. That associate, from the constable's evidence, must be someone in this house. Prince Fu, I'm sure that you're wise enough to appreciate your position. Mr. Holmes, in my own country, I devoted my life to fighting the ravages of drug traffic. Uh, am I then to partake of its profits here in England? Hello, hello, look here. Oh, what is it, Constable? On the desk. It's a doctor's visiting card. Hmm. Henry Sturgeon, M.D., 86 Harley Street. Great Scott. How do you account for this, Prince Fool? I, I am completely bewildered. I have never seen that card before. Nor have I ever heard of a Dr. Sturgeon. I suppose the wind must have blown it in, eh? Funny coincidence and no mistake. Shall I arrest him, Mr. Holmes? No, Meriwether, though I would like you to remain here on guard. In the meanwhile, Watson and I have one vital task to perform. What's that, Holmes? We must search this house from basement to chimney top. We've got to find that missing head. Holmes, I've searched the house with a fine tooth comb. I swear the missing head isn't here. So will I, old chap. That's why I gave you the job of searching for it. Why the blazes waste my time while you go careering all somewhere else? Oh, don't be angry with me, Watson. I needed you to create a diversion to cloak my real activities. Huh? Where have you been? I've been having a most illuminating talk with a certain tradesman by the name of Albert Bloggs. Now I know who our double murderer is. Good Lord. Who? I suggest that we return to Prince Fu Tsen's flat upstairs. There I shall make the matter clear to you. Am I to understand that you have solved this shocking crime? Yes, Prince Fool. Which one of them was it, Mr. Holmes? Meriwether, you've been on this case from the beginning. You've been remarkably astute in some of your deductions. Thank you kindly, sir. That's real praise coming from you, Mr. Holmes. Surely you can see the obvious link between the two murders? I think I can, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Sturgeon got himself strangled with a Chinese cue. Now, we know one of these two men did it. But Mr. Harold Fu wears his hair short like an Englishman. Only the prince has a cue. It must have been him. It seems logical to me, Holmes. And uh, singularly lacking in logic to me, my friend. I quite agree, Prince Fu. You see, Watson, you and Constable Merriweather overlooking the stolen head. Why was it stolen? What more likely reason than for the sake of its cue? And if the merchant's head was the weapon used to strangle Dr. Sturgeon, then the murderer wished to create the imaginary figure of someone wearing a cue. Therefore, the murderer did not have a cue. Then it was Harold Fool. Yes, it must have been. Well, that's utterly ridiculous. Of course it is. You're overlooking one vital point. Limiting our suspects to the prince and Mr. Harold Fool depends entirely on Constable Merriweather's testimony, which means that we have three suspects. And the third is the constable. Me? Oh, you, you're joking, Mr. Holmes. Murder is not a subject for levity, Constable. But Holmes, what motive could he have had? The reason is obvious, Watson. Why did the murders occur immediately after you stumbled into this trafficking in narcotics? Because Merriweather himself was involved with the criminals. He overheard the man last night tell you about Dr. Sturgeon. And so Dr. Sturgeon had to die. Well, you mean that Merriweather was a member of this ring? Of course. And a dishonest policeman could be a very valuable ally. Mr. Rounds, you, you got hold of the wrong end of the stick and no mistake. No, I haven't, Constable. You killed the merchant downstairs, decapitated the poor devil, and then used his cue to strangle Dr. Sturgeon. You lied about the time you'd seen him enter. You said it was after ten o'clock. Well, how can you prove it wasn't that time, Mr. Rounds? I just talked to Albert Bloggs, the fishmonger. He saw you for a moment at 8.30 this morning. He did not see you at ten. Great Scott and Merriweather killed the merchant first, went over to Dr. Sturgeon and strangled him, probably dropped the head into the river, and came back here and lied about the time. Precisely. And on his first visit to this flat, he carefully planted one of Dr. Sturgeon's cards, knowing that it would incriminate Prince Fool. As cold-blooded and horrible a crime as ever I encountered. You're a disgrace to the force, man. Now, wait a moment, wait a moment. You've still got no proof. My word's as good as that stinking fishmonger. I doubt it. In any case, another word pins the crime on you. One from beyond the grave, the dying word that Dr. Sturgeon uttered. He uttered the word peace. And why should he say peace when he was pointing at the address and trying to indicate to us his murderer? 
know. He died while he was saying what sounded like peace. What he was trying to say was PC, which stands for police constable. He died as he tried to accuse his murderer, police constable Merriweather. You'll never get me on the end of that. Grab him, grab him. He's heading for the window. Must be 40 feet down into the street. It'll be a miracle if he hasn't broken his neck. I'll go down and see what I can do for him. A doctor will save a man's life so that he may lose it on the gallows. A quaint custom. Prince who? I must apologize to you and your nephew for the embarrassment and humiliation to which you've been subjected. Mr. Holmes, I must confess that I never expected that my quiet sanctuary, my haven from the outside world, would be brushed by the wings of violence and sudden death. But I have seen justice done. And for the remainder of my poor life, I shall always revere the name of the man responsible, Sherlock Holmes. Ladies, one of the greatest beauty authorities in this country is John Robert Powers. And the first beauty advice Mr. Powers gives his lovely Powers models is to use only cremel shampoo to wash their hair. And isn't he wise, Mr. Bell? Because cremel shampoo is one shampoo that can be bought today that leaves the hair fairly teeming with natural, brilliant highlights. Yet never under any circumstances does cremel shampoo ever dry the hair. You see, cremel shampoo is not a soapless shampoo. It's not a cream shampoo. It's entirely different. How right you are, Mr. Bell. Why, after a cremel shampoo, even dull, lifeless-looking hair actually radiates all its... Na- Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.